So good evening, folks. Um, welcome to the Friends of Gold Butte speaker series, where every month during the nice season, we uh, have guest speakers come and giving us wonderful presentations uh, of interest. And today's speech and presentation is going to be about birds. Our guest speaker is Alex, Alex Harper. Uh, he's a native. Well, let's welcome him. So he is a native of uh, Miami, Florida. So he took a roundabout way of getting here, but he is here now. He lives in Las Vegas and, and he is a naturalist. He is an avian biologist, does all sorts of nature stuff and wilderness leading and a whole bunch of stuff. Wonderful. And now he's focusing on writing and education and he is the chair of the Audubon Society, the Red Rock Audubon Society's Outreach and Education Committee. So that's some really wonderful things. So, so I know you're all eager to learn about birds of the, of the Mojave area and what they do throughout the year. So I'm gonna pass the mic over to Alex so he can get started with his presentation, all right? Thank you, Frank. Uh, so, Thank you all for coming out on a fairly chilly weekday uh, evening. Um, my name is Alex Harper. I am very excited to be here. Uh, I live in Las Vegas right across from It was quite a trek to come up here, but uh, I made the most of my afternoon coming up. And I didn't know a lot about mesquite. Uh, I've passed through mesquite quite a bit. Uh, once upon a time, I was doing a lot of field work uh, in renewables and heading up to Utah quite a bit to survey areas around beaver, uh, looking for golden eagles. And I passed through Mesquite and I was like, oh, okay, it's another town along the interstate and uh, went on my merry way. But this time I get to hang out and I am uh, really pleasantly surprised to see uh, the community here that seems to be very uh, engaged and interested in uh, what's going on in the region. So thank you for having me. Um, it, is, it is truly a pleasure and I love doing this stuff. Uh, I have an early morning. Uh, I will be on that bus that Frank mentioned, uh, heading from Las Vegas down to Laughlin to um, state a couple things to uh, the Bureau of Land Management uh, about my thoughts about a Vico May National Monument being designated and the importance of that region, uh, not only to the people, although there, there are people that will speak a lot more fluently about that than I will, uh, but I'll be talking about birds and bighorn sheep and desert tortoise and uh, a lot of the wildlife that lives in that part of the Mojave Desert along the Colorado River. So I've got an early morning, uh, but I will be hanging out here to answer questions uh, for a little bit before I make that long trek back to Las Vegas, settle in, and wake up to head over to Laughlin. So, um, this, uh, this presentation I've done a couple times now, so I like to think that I've got it kind of dialed and I want to do improv just a little bit. Um, this is titled Through the Seasons or a couple different directions I could have gone with this audience about birds of this region of the Mojave Desert. I'm not going to focus on Gold Butte specifically, but that's okay because I will be talking about uh, sort of the, the, the broad view of the, the region, how birds are moving through the Mojave Desert, the Colorado Plateau, and the other deserts of North America. So there should be something uh, here for everybody. It's not gonna be terribly dense, but there will be some, uh, some information in here. If you are a lifelong birder or you're brand new, you don't know anything about birds, uh, there will be things in here for you. So, um, okay, so I'm just rambling at this point, but um, again, my name is Alex Harper. I am a uh, avian biologist. Uh, I came out here from Miami, Florida, a small town, small sleepy town. It's kind of like uh, mesquite uh, and sleepiness <laughs> level. Um, and I came out here actually in 2015 to work as a field biologist at the renewables, like I mentioned, uh, working at the Ivanpah Solar Generating Facility uh, over near California. And then I started to do more field work all around the region, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Wyoming, Colorado, pretty much all of the Western states uh, I've worked as a biologist. So I have a pretty good sense of what's going on here in terms of how birds are moving around. Nowadays, 
I am working as an educator for Red Rock Autobot Society, which is uh, the local chapter in serving Southern Nevada. Uh, it is sort of the, the Autobot chapter of a national organization that serves a lot of the Mojave Desert. Over in St. George, there is an Audubon chapter. It's called the Red Cliffs Audubon, uh, but we are the largest of the Audubon chapters in the Mojave. And I've been working uh, as an education outreach coordinator and other board of directors since last year. And I'm also a voting member within Nevada Birds Records Committee. Believe it or not, um, the, the state monitors the, uh, the birds that move in and out, and I'm on a committee that reviews unusual sightings as a way to um, keep track of the bird diversity in the state. So here we go through the seasons, bird diversity in Southern Nevada. Uh, so I'll let you just read through this really quickly. Um, you know, every organization, uh, at, at least in the conservation space, has a vision and a mission. Here is ours. I'll let you read through that. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, is you talking about the logo? Oh, the road. Uh, this is over at Calico Basin at Red Rock Canyon. I, I heard, what bird is that? You're like, oh, wow, you got great eyesight. I don't see it. <laughs> okay, so how's this going to go? Uh, so here's our overall flow. This is just to give you a little preview of, of how to see this presentation. We'll start with that big picture, that climate and regional influence factor. We'll go through our habitats, uh, what I call the biological calendar. This is really fascinating and something that I'm always paying attention to. For example, every single day after I go for my little walk around my neighborhood, I go back and I make a quick note, maybe two or three sentences of what the birds are doing, which birds are coming through. I want to know exactly what each bird is doing uh, every single day so that I can keep track of it. Go down to the date, how the robins are moving or what the mock birds are doing. So I call that the biological calendar. Uh, challenges and, and some small solutions, because of course there are challenges that birds face, and where to view birds. I won't uh, talk about gold people that much. It'll be more focused on Las Vegas, but uh, we'll, we'll cross that bridge later. All right. Anyone ever heard of Jim Boone? <laughs> Jim Boone has uh, one of the best maps of the four North American deserts around that I can find on the internet. Um, I, I didn't go onto his website to take this photo. It just came up on a Google image search. I loved it because it, it really showed our four North American deserts. Uh, we are situated in the eastern edge of the Mojave Desert. It's the smallest desert in North America. Uh, we have four deserts in the United States and in Mexico. And uh, you can think of our desert being uh, basically the range of the Joshua tree. The Joshua tree is what's known as the indicator species for this desert. Uh, once you start to get in areas outside of uh, where Joshua trees are found, uh, then you are probably not in the Mojave Desert anymore. You might be in the Sonoran or the Great Basin. And uh, there should be no Joshua trees anywhere close to the Chihuahua Desert. Um, so to the north of us, we have the Great Basin Desert, most of Nevada. Uh, it falls within the Great Basin Desert. So think of sagebrush and rabbit brush, uh, cold winters, and a lot more precipitation in the form of snowfall. For us in the Mojave, we get about four inches of, uh, of precipitation annually, mostly in the form of monsoonal rains and a little bit of snow, as you can see in the Virgin Mountain Range over here. And the Sonoran Desert gets about twice the amount of rainfall as we do. Uh, they don't have regular freezes, and that's why they have such high cacti diversity. They have the saguaro cacti and a number of other cacti that we just can't have here. It's just not the right climate. So superimpose that map in your mind and lay it over this. What you're looking at here is a uh, on the left hand side is a map of four flyways in North America. And what flyways are, are basically paths that birds take seasonally between uh, the spring and the fall. So 
If you look at where Nevada is, we are fit snugly in the Pacific Flyway and just outside of what's known as the Central Flyway. And so birds that are coming from Canada or Alaska or say even Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and passing through here on their way to Mexico or the Sonoran Desert, or maybe just this is their final destination, they're going to be taking these, uh, these flyways. And within these four main flyways, we have smaller micro flyways. And for us in Nevada, if you look at the right hand side, look at all those mountain ranges. We have so many mountain ranges. And uh, most of them are actually oriented north to south. And so for birds that are migrating, might, uh, you, you might know that birds that migrate mostly north to south or south to north, depending on the season, they're taking these mountain ranges. Mountain ranges are incredibly important to migratory birds because what they don't necessarily want to do, unless they're a water bird, is end up in an arid open desert where there aren't a lot of trees, not a lot of cover, not a lot of water. So in our mountain ranges, we are getting lots of birds moving through. So if you look at this map on the right hand side, I have these little arrows. I'm just sort of uh, simulating what it might be like for a bird of prey or a songbird to be migrating in the fall uh, from north to south. They're going to be following these mountain ranges. And I tailored this just for you. I had the bird go to the virgin range just for this audience. And uh, the reason they're taking these mountain ranges is because they can find water. They can find springs, like the spring mountain range, where I photographed this western tanager this past September. It is drinking water over at Deer Creek, which is a picnic area where there are regular springs. Um, the namesake for the spring mountains uh, is because of the regular uh, springs that, that kind of come up from several of the canyons and are very important stopover locations for birds like the Western Tanager. So when do these birds migrate? Well, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna pull an example here of, uh, again, fall, because that is a season that's just uh, in the rear view here. It, it really feels like winter. Um, some might say it's still fall, but um, again, this is, this is one of the, the mechanisms, the driving forces that allows these birds to fly. Uh, in, in the fall. Uh, migration is hazardous for birds. Many of these birds might only weigh about an ounce or two ounces. Uh, birds weigh very, very little. That helps them stay aloft and in the air without spending, uh, expending a lot of energy. And what they tend to do is they wait for a, a wind front to move in the direction that they want to go so that they have a nice tailwind. What the bird doesn't want to do is fly into a headwind. That means that if, if it went to a headwind, it would uh, expend a lot of energy and it would take a lot longer to get to where it wants to go. So what they do is in the fall, they wait for those cold fronts to uh, help them advance forward to where they want to go. So if you look at the northern part of this map around Alaska or Nunavut, uh, Northwestern Territories of Yukon, you have different shades of colors coming down towards the equator uh, over to Mexico. And this is representing the changes in daylight, day, the, the, the amount of minutes that are lost. If you look over in the northern part, you're losing 9 to 11 minutes around the fall uh, equinox, so around September 21st or so. That's the first day of fall. And that is when you are losing daylight after that in the northern hemisphere quite rapidly. The northern, the, the northern latitudes lose a lot more daylight, so they get colder faster. And what does cold air do? It tends to sink, and warm air rises. So the warm air would be closer to Mexico, maybe Nevada. The cold air is uh, in the northern latitudes. And so that hot air rises, and the cold air rushes in to replace it. And what you get with that is wind. And with that wind, the birds start to migrate. So they're going to be following these little icons here, which are my little representations of the wind. And you can think of the birds flying south with those first cold fronts. So that is our longitudinal and latitudinal dimension. 
But of course, there's a altitude in all this going. I already mentioned that these birds are taking off if it's the springtime. Uh, but birds tend to also gravitate towards certain plant communities. So for us here in Mesquite, we're, uh, we're still in sort of the creosote desert. You have a lot of creosote and bursage. But if you started going towards uh, Virgin Mountains, or if you were in the Spring Range or the Sheep Range closer to Las Vegas, you would be in creosote from 1,000 to 4,000 feet elevation. If you start to go higher and higher, you would end up in Joshua Tree and Black Brush, so 3,000 and 5,000. Uh, if you went higher and higher, you would end up in your pinion, juniper woodlands, and you'd see some scrub oak with, uh, with acorns. You'd have some mountain mahogany. You keep going higher and higher, um, maybe a little bit too high for the Virgin Mountain Range. I know you have some Douglas firs up there, but you're not really going to run into aspens and ponderosa pine up there, but you will uh, closer to Bryce or Zion uh, or in some of the plateaus like the Colorado Plateau. And of course, you've got bristlecone pines, the higher elevations. And finally, depending on which mountain range you're in, you will reach treeline. So for us in Las Vegas, where we have Mount Charleston, it's almost 12,000 feet. That is above treeline. So no trees up there. So depending on where you're at, you're going to find different birds. Um, here, I would expect to see mostly birds that like the riparian areas along the Virgin River or the creosote, uh, the creosote flats. But maybe there are parts of Gold Butte that have some Joshua trees, and you might expect to see some birds in the Joshua trees there too. Yeah. How's this? How's this, everybody over there? Okay. Um, yeah. Let me know if if it's not working out. So, um, so those are some of our 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 spatial components. Okay, so we've got those out of the way. We have hopefully a little bit of intuition now about how that works, but let's talk about these seasons. We don't necessarily have four concrete seasons, but we can break them up just a little bit. Uh, they don't work too neatly, but uh, you, you'll see how this, how this will work out. Okay, so let's say that this is functionally fall, fall migration. Believe it or not, some birds begin migrating in late July, or August, some of our birds from uh, Alaska and Canada might only breed one time because up there it's already wintertime uh, by say September. So they actually get out really quickly. They breed one time and then they skedaddle. So we actually start getting some of those breeders up there uh, by late August or excuse me, late July, even in, in August. And they're called shorebirds. We'll get insectivores. These are birds that eat insects primarily. They start to move through in September. And then birds that feed on those insectivores uh, will follow them because, of course, they're following their, their food. And uh, then we start to get some of our woodpeckers, bluebirds, robins, sparrows, finches in October. So those are the birds that we're kind of uh, getting now. That last group of birds, they can eat fruit and nuts. Okay, so their food uh, source doesn't change in the wintertime. The insectivores, they have to go find insects and they're not gonna find insects here in the dead of winter. So they vacate, they get out. They go over to Mexico, uh, Central America and South America. We won't see them again until April from getting ahead of myself. These are some of our shorebirds. These are some of those birds that I mentioned that start to show up in late July August and pass through into September. You're looking at four different types of shorebirds. It's a very, very diverse order of birds. There are about 70 that live in North America. Many of them actually do pass through here um, and they pass through looking for water. So they are looking for places like the shores of the Virgin River. Uh, Bowman Reservoir actually is a great place to look for shorebirds, Clark County Wetlands Park. And then many of these birds are heading over to the Sea of Cortez or down to Panama, even South America for the winter time. Um, shorebirds uh, feed on different things along the shore, but of course we have 70 different species that can't all look for food the same way. So uh, their leg length and their bill length and shape will help them uh, sort of uh, segregate amongst one another to find different food sources. So this avocet at the top left, uh, is very large with long legs and a long sweeping bill. 
they can go deeper into the water and catch things on the surface of the water. The dowager at the top right, it actually probes that bill into mud and can feel the pressure from invertebrates that it wants to pull out. And it probes in there with that long straight bill and pulls out things like worms. The killdeer at the bottom right, that bird actually walks along the edge of the water, never really in the water, and picks things off the surface. And then these little leaf sandpipers, these are small shorebirds, about the 70 that we have in North America. Uh, they like to probe along the edge of the water as well, sometimes just going about an inch into the water. These are some of those insectivores that are quite colorful. This is uh, a representation of some of the warblers that we have. They're tiny, they're finch size, they're sparrow size, about five inches long. They weigh less than an ounce. And they are heading from some of our mountain ranges or Canada, Alaska, and they're heading typically into Central and South America. You can find these birds here in the spring and the summer and the fall, but not right now. They're, they're gone. You won't see these birds again until spring. Following those insectivores are birds like this American kestrel. An American kestrel is a small falcon. And uh, birds like this falcon or the sharp shinned hawk, cooper's hawks, they are following those insectivores, uh, many of those songbirds, because they eat mostly songbirds. The kestrel will eat things like grasshoppers and butterflies, which also aren't really around in the wintertime. So you don't see these birds that much, although a couple kestrels will spend the winter here. I actually saw one sitting on a billboard uh, when I was getting off of Sand Hill uh, off of the uh, interstate on, on the way over here. So. Uh, they are here year-round. This is the American Kestrel. You definitely have these in Mesquite. You can see this tomorrow. This is a northern flicker. It's a type of woodpecker. And they are one of the last birds to come in for the fall. So they will be coming in um, right about now uh, and will be here until April. Look for this bird feeding on the ground. They like to eat ants a lot, so they'll go up to ant hills and eat ants. Has anyone seen this bird before? You recognize this bird? This is one of your most common backyard birds. This is a white crowned sparrow. They'll hang out in quail bushes and salt bush. Uh, they love backyards. If you have bird feeders, this bird is at your bird feeder right now. Uh, I'm not a gambling man. I, I live in Las Vegas. I've gambled maybe twice since I've been there, and that was good enough for me, but I would bet that this bird is in your yard right now sleeping. I can't wait to wake up and eat seeds in your backyard. This is a white crowned sparrow. Yellow rumped warbler, tons of these moving through. This is one of the only insectivores that we get here in the wintertime. So there are exceptions to that rule. The reason that is that this bird is basically like the raccoon or the possum of the warblers. What I mean by that is they are a generalist. They are so good at adapting to the scenario. Whatever the environment gives them, they can make the most of it. Generalists are very good at finding food in all sorts of ways, as opposed to the opposite uh, part of that spectrum, which might be called a specialist, something that has a very unique way that is, it is successful. There are birds like that, but not this one. This is a generalist. They can find food by, um, you know, going onto fences or into the sides of trees. They'll look under uh, leaves at the tops of trees. They'll be on the ground looking through cracks in the sidewalk to find, you know, uh, like dead spiders or insects. They'll make it work throughout the winter months. Moving into winter, November to early March. Definitely feels like it's winter time right now, even though technically uh, we still have like another month of fall. So to recap, our insectivores, those insect eaters mostly are in the warmest Sonora Desert or Central and South America where they can find insects or berries all year long, even in December, January, and February, the coldest months of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. And we start to get our waterfowl again. You have probably noticed that the golf courses or some of your water features, you start to see more and more ducks arriving. Maybe there are a couple more geese coming through. Uh, you might even get a swan for a couple of days out here. Uh, that is because they're starting to return. Your seed-eating birds, they're here all winter long, because again, they can find their seeds pretty much anywhere, anytime. As long as it's not covered in snow, they can find their food. 
and uh, our wetlands are vibrant with bird life. Along the Virgin River, you will always find lots of birds. Uh, our mountains are less active than other months, but we'll talk about some of the birds that can make it work high in the mountain ranges, and even in the winter. So these are uh, some dabbling ducks in northern pintail and some green with teal returning to southern Nevada. I took this photo just a couple weeks ago. Those geese are coming back. Those geese are coming back. So you, you probably have a couple of year round resident Canada geese, the bane of some people's existence in some parts. Uh, but you will have some snow geese and some cackling geese come through too. The cackling goose on the left might look like a Canada goose, but it is a miniature version of a Canada goose coming from the Aleutian Range of Alaska, right? That big, long 1,000 mile chain that runs off of mainland Alaska actually has that cackling goose, and they come down here to southern Nevada. Why? I don't know, but that's, uh, that's what they do. Now, over at Lake Mead, we have uh, a couple introduced shellfish, and by a couple, I mean like many millions of them at this point in Lake Mead. And they're causing all sorts of ecological issues. They are filter feeders. They, uh, they actually filter out and eat a lot of uh, planktonic life. So they're, they're, they're causing some huge issues. But it's always interesting to me when some birds benefit from something like this, right? Like we're, we're seeing some of the, the bad effects of these uh, invertebrates and this ecosystem that has been created by people that's also causing problems like itself. But these birds are called scoters. They're types of ducks. And unlike familiar ducks like mallards, uh, what they do is they dive down and they actually uh, feed on hard shelled organisms. They're sea ducks. They live mostly off of the Pacific. Most of the population is off of Oregon or Baja or California at this moment but some of them do come into Lake Mead and they actually eat these invasive mussels. Not enough to control the population at all, but it's interesting to me when they are around. And so these were over um, at Boulder Beach near Lake Mead. These are uh, two species of scoters. The central one is called the black scoter. And then the, um, the two on either side of the middle bird are white, or excuse me, surf scoters. Believe it or not, we get bald eagles in Southern Nevada. You can get them uh, over in the Overton Arm. You can get them at Perenigat National Wildlife Refuge. You can get them at some of the reservoirs in Utah. Uh, some of them actually do breed along the Colorado River uh, between Searchlight and, uh, and, and Laughlin and Lake Mead over in Black Canyon. There's a pair up there. Oh. And, and really quickly, it takes five years for a bald eagle to get its iconic white head, its white tail, and its dark brown, almost black body. Um, going up to that point, they are a series of, of mottled browns. So this is about a two-year-old based off of its plumage. Our state bird, the mountain bluebird, you can get them here uh, in this area, uh, especially around golf courses in like open areas where they can uh, feed on some of the hardy insects that are around in those fields. They're also eating lots of juniper berries up in our mountain ranges at this moment. So they're probably up in the Virgin Mountain Range right now, definitely on the Colorado Plateau. And of course, in our mountains, we have a couple birds. Some of them are insanely hardy. This is a mountain chickadee. This is one of the smallest birds that we have in North America, smaller than a sparrow. And they are surviving all year long at high elevations, pretty much up to tree line. So if you were to go up into, uh, you know, uh, what's it called? Eagle, Eagle Creek or Eagle Point, the ski area up in Utah, you'd find these birds around the ski lifts. And these birds have really remarkable ways of surviving in the winter. Some other small songbirds also have this ability. These birds have a daytime active body temperature of about 107 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's, uh, that would definitely kill a human being at, being at that, uh, that temperature. We start to have a lot of issues around 103, 104. They're getting up to 107 during the day. At night to survive, they will huddle together 
as a group and they will shiver when they need to, but they can get down to about 86 degrees Fahrenheit at night. So they're going from 86 at night up to uh, 107 during the day. So that's about a 20 to 21 uh, degree range for these birds. That's how they survive those cold, cold nights. I mean, can you imagine spending one night up on one of those mountains? Um, this is a bird that weighs about half an ounce. So that's moving through winter time. So let's start thinking about spring. For all of us here, we're probably over the winter time. Like right now, we're probably really excited about this cold weather. It's uh, uh, maybe a little uh, rejuvenating. Maybe you're not so thrilled about the fact that it's getting dark at 445 right now. But it, to me, I, I love winter time. Uh, but by around February, I'm over it. I'm ready to see some some leaves back on those trees. I can't wait to hear the bird song again. I just want to go outside and not be cold. I start to regret feeling that around I don't know, May or June when it's really hot, uh, but that's, that's, uh, that's life in Southern Nevada, right? So in the spring, we are functionally, as far as birds go, uh, in spring, in the lowlands around mid-March. So our birds are starting to uh, our, our waterfowl, our ducks, and our geese are starting to head north. They're going to go um, find ponds and lakes that are open, that are ice-free, right? They need ice-free lakes, so they're going to go uh, not leave until they are certain that they have a place to land and feed. Um, our birds here in Mesquite, they will start to sing maybe in late February, and by March, they're creating nests, and they're starting to uh, be territorial. They start to have their young, and you might even see some young hummingbirds uh, hatching and fledging by, uh, by March or April. And then all of our birds that are coming back from South Central America, the Sonoran Desert, Mexico, they're coming back up. So it's like the floodgates open one day. The, the winds now are coming from the South and those birds have these southerly winds to take them north. And that happens in April and May is just going off with birds. Uh, we have a yearly competition called a Birdathon, which raises money for Penny J. I'll talk about Penny J in just a moment. And people are going out for 24 hours and birding just around Las Vegas and the Spring Mountains and tallying anywhere between 150 and 170 species of birds in one day, all right? So that's, that's pretty phenomenal uh, bird diversity, just, just in Clark County. There's some northern pintail migrating north. As I mentioned, our shorebirds, those birds that start to migrate uh, south in late July and August and September, well, they're starting to come back up. And I decided to include a photo of a lesser yellow legs, it's just as, as an example. Okay, so you have your lesser yellow legs here on the left. This is actually feeding in the Las Vegas wash. The Las Vegas wash has actually turned out to be a pretty important place for shorebirds to stop. They're looking for water to find food. And with so many of our natural wetlands drying up, they're actually turning into urban areas to, um, to find their, uh, their resources to help them have their fuel to go north or south, depending on the time of year. So this photo is taken at the Las Vegas Wash. And you can see here a range map on the right-hand side. And just to help you orient with a range map, a range map is gonna tell you where this bird's range is. Like, where does it live? Where is it spending its, uh, its time as a species? So the, the range of the entire population of lesser yellow legs uh, breeds in the boreal forests, the taiga, habitats, where taiga means the land of little sticks in Russia. Okay, so they're in the taiga, the boreal forest of Canada and parts of Alaska. The gray is where they migrate through and blue is where they winter. So you can see it has a pretty big range. And uh, where I'm from in Florida, you can find lesser yellow legs all winter long, just about anywhere in the state. You can find them along the Gulf Coast. And they actually winter down in the Salton Sea area and parts of Southern California, pass through Nevada, uh, twice a year uh, to get to these two locations where they spend the winter and the summer. So you can see here, uh, all of Nevada, you can expect to see lesser yellow legs if you're in the right habitat, if you're in a wetland 
and you happen to be looking and recognize that bird, which takes some practice. Our songbirds are coming back. Um, they're coming back when the trees start to leaf out because they need cover, they need places to hide, they need food to eat. And in the case of the black-headed grosbeaks at Corn Creek, where I photographed this bird this last May, they were gorging on mulberries, mulberry fruit. They were in the orchard there. And um, that certainly gives them a lot of fat and a lot of calories to help them make that long flight to wherever they're going. So that's sort of a whirlwind through spring. And let's get into the summer. Oof. Yeah, the summer months here in Southern Nevada. Okay. It's actually quite interesting what these birds do. Okay, so summer is staggered elevationally. And what I mean by that is um, we have a lot of areas in Southern Nevada where you have low elevation, like, like say along the Colorado River, you're, you're at like 800 feet in elevation in some places, not like me. But the top of Mount Charleston is almost 12,000 feet. So you're looking at a range of about 11,000 feet more or less from the lowest point to the highest point in Clark County. And you're gonna have different uh, changes in temperature over time. So in the spring mountains, like say eight or 9,000 feet in elevation, it's not gonna really feel like spring until say April or May. Um, that's when the plants start to leaf out and they start to put out their flowers and the bugs start to come back. But uh, by May, as you know, here in Mesquite, it's already feeling like summer, right? So that's what I mean by summer being uh, staggered elevationally. In the lowlands, like in Mesquite or Las Vegas, birds are breeding several times. Uh, they just have a lot of time to, uh, to have trees that are producing fruit or insects. As long as they can find their water, they're, they're going to do just fine. Uh, if you're interested in, in um, getting to know your birds, this is a fun time to watch parents defend territory or uh, take care of their young, rear their young. And um, you can do this probably from the comfort of your, uh, your house, your apartment, looking out the window, cranking the AC. Thought I had one more note there. This is a, uh, a bird that you're probably very familiar with, your Northern Mockingbird. Has anyone heard those birds singing at one in the morning, two in the morning? three in the morning, maybe four in the morning. Okay, yep, they definitely know. So the Northern Mockingbird is one of those birds that uh, can mimic other uh, birds and actual other sounds. Some birds um, basically copy their, their, their parents, uh, their parents' song. That's how they learn song, uh, is by copying their parents. Some birds are born with the ability to sing the, the songs that is unique to their species so that they can communicate with other members of their species. Other birds like the mockingbird can do a little bit of all of that. Mostly they're learning from their parents, but they can also learn on the fly. Uh, they can learn throughout their lives different sounds so they can learn the songs of like a squeaking uh, swing set, for example. Uh, they can learn to do that, a car alarm, a barking dog, they can learn those things. And they like to sing during full moons. Now, uh, it makes sense to hear that bird singing during a full moon. But when we have porch lights and artificial lights all night long on to the mockingbird, it's all the same. They're just happy that there's a light on. And you, we've tricked them into singing all night long during the spring and the summer. Uh, Lesser goldfinch, this is a bird that if you wanted to attract birds to your yard, um, your parks, you can plant things like sunflowers or native plants because native plants attract native birds. Lesser goldfinch here is coming into sunflowers uh, that were planted actually um, over at the Mystery Ranch near Searchlight. These are uh, some sunflowers that ended up growing there. And I photographed these lesser goldfinches coming in to eat the seeds from them. So if you build it, they will come. Up in the mountains in the summertime, we have a number of different uh, bird species coming into a number of different coniferous trees. So trees that are bearing cones, a lot of those trees are creating food for birds, like the nuthatch on the right, the Clark's nutcracker on the left, the Clark's nutcracker, 
And the pygmy nuthatch are uh, some of several species of birds that you can find in the pinion juniper woodlands or around uh, the Douglas firs, ponderosa pine, limber pine. And what these birds do is really fascinating and very important for us if we're interested in conservation of plants and the integrity of our uh, biological communities. We need to know this type of information because what these birds do is they actually depend on the seeds coming from those cones and they eat those seeds and they fly off and either cache them so they'll store them somewhere with the intent of going back to find them later and eat those seeds. And sometimes they forget where they are and they've just planted a, uh, a limber pine seed that can germinate or a bristlecone pine seed. Okay, so those birds are really, really important for the survival ship of some of these trees. And so uh, this is a relationship that goes both ways. The birds need the pine cones and the pine trees that produce those cones need those birds. If you remove too many pieces from this, uh, this mechanism, well, the whole thing starts to fall apart, okay? So from a conservation standpoint, these birds are so important. And get a little bit towards the end here. Let me see how I'm doing on time. I think I'm doing all right. This is a pinion jay. This is a bird that we're really concerned about throughout Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, um, all of the great basin states and the Mojave region. This is a pinion jay that I photographed feeding on a pinion pine that had just produced fresh cones in late August and early September. This is over in the Spring Mountain Range. These birds are definitely, definitely over in the Zion area. They're definitely in the Virgin Mountains in the pinion pine forest collecting the pinion pine cones. And so what they're doing is they are caching them for the winter time. They will fly up and take some of those pieces of, um, of pine cone and they'll eat some of it on the spot, but for the most part, they're planting them, and caching them as if it's a surplus. So they're gonna take those little bits of pine cone, plant them, come back and eat them later on, but sometimes they forget them and they just planted a pinion pine seed that might germinate and become a full tree, a full tree that uh, after a couple of decades will produce cones for future generations of pinion jays. So that's how a lot of these coniferous forests work. They're dependent on the rodents like squirrels and a lot of our birds to keep them going. If we lose these birds, if we lose things like red squirrels or some of our golden mantle um, uh, ground squirrels, well, we're going to start to see big changes in the types of plants that we get up there. And here's a, <laughs> here's a, a very zealous pinion jay flying off of this cone. Okay, so that is, um, that's our biological calendar in a nutshell. Uh, we have 415 species that have been recorded in Clark County alone. So I could go on and on and on. I can go so many different directions, but I wanted to give you sort of a, a broad overview so that depending on where you're at and your interest in observing birds, um, you have a, a, a starting point or a, a framework to work with them. Uh, I think that watching birds is just so exciting and you can make connections with your, uh, the place that you live in or the place that you're visiting by observing what the birds are doing. The bird's behavior is driven by weather the time of year. And so uh, right now, I'm really enjoying watching the robins come and basically uh, invade bushes in Las Vegas that are producing berries right now. They're going to eat those berries uh, for, for the next few weeks until there are no more berries left, and they're going to go disperse all over the city uh, through the poop. So thank you, birds, for giving us forests. Um, What's going on with birds uh, globally and within our region? Well, um, climate change is bearing down on lots of bird populations. So that's, uh, that's big time, uh, a, a, a thing that Audubon Society is thinking about. How do we help birds during a time where we have this invisible enemy to uh, biodiversity all around the world? So that's, that's number one. Uh, but if we had to 
uh, look at the other big things that affect birds. Um, window collisions, you know, birds running into windows when they see the reflection of a tree uh, reflected off of a window, they think they're flying into a tree and bang, they hit a, a window. Uh, a lot of birds die that way. Um, we have, let's see, cats. Cats kill billions of birds uh, just in the United States. Um, a lot of people uh, want to have their cats outdoors all the time or some of the time. I, I totally understand you want a good life for your cat. If you're one of those people, um, one thing that I, I would just sort of say, like just kind of meet me in the middle here. Uh, during the morning or the, the evening, that's when birds are the most active. So if you have cats and want them outside, you can be helping birds out big time. If you keep your cats inside uh, first thing in the morning or in the late afternoon, uh, and March to May, when you have lots of baby birds on the ground that can't fly, a lot of those are taken by cats. So uh, if you kept your cats more inside in the springtime, you definitely help a lot of baby birds make it to maturity. Uh, other things that are going on, you know, drink shade, grow in coffee. Who would have thought of that? I love coffee, uh, but coffee plantations are monocultures um, and, you know, birds are... Um, getting to Mexico or Colombia or Costa Rica, and they're finding that their primary forests have been cut down for, uh, for coffee plantations. So it just kind of seems like, oh, why can't we have nice things, right? Um, it's, it, it, there, are, there are all these ways that um, birds and, and wildlife, uh, all types of wildlife are affected by our consumption. So I'm not here to tell anyone what you should or shouldn't do. I'm definitely not that type of person, but I did want to just sort of bring up here, here are the things that are basic. Or that the birds are facing that are having big time impacts uh, on them. Uh, we have partners like the American Bird Conservancy, of course, Audubon, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. I'm happy to say that I did bird uh, surveys for them in really awesome places like Big Bend National Park, uh, Grand Teton National Park, um, when I was just starting out as a biologist. And of course, you have Smithsonian and the Cornell Lab. Uh, Georgetown University. Um, for us in the Mojave Desert, how can we help birds when they are facing all of these challenges? Not just birds, but uh, mammals, reptiles, insects, or monarch butterflies. Uh, what can we do to be um, better, better allies for them, better conservationists? Well, water is a big deal in the Mojave Desert, right? Um, we are in a drought. We are losing a lot of our groundwater. Las Vegas uh, takes 90% of its water from Lake Mead, 10% from groundwater. And by the way, a lot of our groundwater has been water that has been recharged from Lake Mead. Uh, so it's not original groundwater from the Pleistocene epoch a couple thousand years ago. It's actually been recharged from Lake Mead. Um, we can maintain guzzlers like the Nevada Department wildlife and friends in Nevada wilderness, they go out and they actually create uh, guzzlers, so places where wildlife can go drink water. It doesn't do anything to water all the plants that are in a big spatial area, but it does help those birds and mammals out. And uh, Endow, I believe, is also creating seed islands, which is a really cool concept. So basically they're um, creating areas where they're planting certain native plants and watering them so in areas that are drought stricken and not receiving precipitation, they're actually planting these islands of native plants and uh, allowing them to grow to a point that they can produce seeds and they allow the kangaroo rats, the antelope ground squirrel and the birds to eat those seeds and go disperse them out in the desert. How cool is that? How cool is that that we're providing some habitat for plants and we're allowing the animals to go uh, disperse those plants so that the next generation of plants can grow again and repropagate a desert that is suffering due to drought. Um, I encourage you to plant native and drought tolerant species of shrubs. This is more for us in Las Vegas who uh, are, are really uh, having a hard time grappling with the fact that by 2026, the Southern Nevada Water Authority is going to mandate that we have all non functional turf removed and replaced with this airscape. Well, what are we going to replace them with? Might as well replace them with things like palo verde and mesquite, um, native plants that the birds and native bees and butterflies can use. 
Why not plant more milkweed to assist the monarch butterfly that is um, on its way to being considered an endangered species? And uh, the uh, milkweed is a host plant for the monarch. And identify important areas and corridors. So corridors are areas that are basically like highways for animals to move uh, between populations. So um, identifying those areas can be critically important. A lot of not registered this important corridors, some of this other stuff I already mentioned, and, um, you know, see who's doing stuff for birds or wildlife in your area. Uh, for us, Audubon Society certainly is doing stuff. Great Basin Bird Observatory um, manages a lot of projects in uh, Nevada, and we do community and, and citizen science projects, so they're free. We ask people uh, to give some of their time, and we train people up on how to go collect data, um, and we've got some Christmas bird counts coming up. We'll talk about those in just a moment. Not really applying to you, but if you visit Las Vegas, these are the places to go birding. And with the exception of UNLV and Winchester to Nero Cultural Center, Pueblo Park on the west side, all these other places have surface water. All of them are either natural springs or more likely they are uh, parks that have been sourced by well water. Find the surface water, you will find the wildlife. So surface water is incredibly important to us in Southern Nevada. Here in Gold Butte, look for your rock wrens and your cannon wrens. And stay in touch. Um, you know, here's my email, uh, my personal, and then my Red Rock Audubon email. Uh, you can take a photo of this or we can talk afterwards. Uh, that my number's there, but don't spam me. I've already had enough spam the last few weeks, but uh, I don't know, call me in case of a bird emergency, but uh, email works just fine. Um, Christmas bird counts. Uh, your speaker next month is David Sizdick. He is going to be uh, talking to you probably about uh, Muddy River or Wapa Valley. Uh, he works with the Southern Nevada Water Authority. And he also is the compiler for the Muddy River uh, Christmas bird count. So ask him about that if you're interested in getting uh, uh, some citizen science done around January 1st, early in the morning. Uh, I don't know if anyone here is going to be staying up until midnight uh, and then waking up at like four in the morning to go birding. I know that I'm probably going to skip this one. Uh, but I, I might show up, so maybe you'll see there if you're interested in, in going, and you don't need any, uh, any prior experience birding. We will pair you with somebody who knows uh, their bird species, and if you can hold a clipboard and, and tally, you're good to go. So we will also train you along the way. <laughs> Ta-da! There you have it. So, thank you. Um, I will take questions and before I get carried away with those, I did want to mention that uh, there's stuff out there for you to take on the, the table. You can take those home. They're just sort of like informational brochures that you can take. Some of them will tell you about our organization. And um, I also brought some stuff that costs money. Uh, they are um, bird guides that Red Rock Audubon created. They worked with Jay's Bird Barn over in Prescott, Arizona, and David Allen Sibley to create these customized Southern Nevada bird guides. So they're very handy, they're $10 each. If you're interested in those, um, we, can, uh, we can go through that transaction. Uh, again, like cash or uh, Venmo, both of those are great. Uh, those are $10 each and they're, they're worth it, especially if you don't have any uh, field guides. You can use those at Gold Butte, you can use them at Mesquite, you can use them all over Southern Nevada to help you uh, identify the okay so for the the people that are tuning in and streaming uh there's a question about how do hummingbirds feed throughout the winter time and um and and how can we assist them well the interesting thing is is we have six species of hummingbirds that regularly occur in the state two of them are found all year round and they're here in the winter time too so your annas and your costas hummingbirds both of them are coming into flowering plants but many of them will also eat insects too. Um, insects on some of those warm days, they'll have flying insects, uh, but they're also going after a lot of uh, flowers that are here year round, like some of them like lantana 
uh, will be around even in January, and February. Interesting thing about hummingbirds and the creation of hummingbird feeders. With the proliferation and popularity of hummingbird feeders all across the, the continent of North America, these hummingbirds don't necessarily need to migrate to where they originally did before hummingbird feeders were created. So we've actually altered the range of hummingbirds and other birds with that go, are going to seed feeders too, uh, by creating food sources that they can depend on year round. So, you know, like they're just kind of like, well, I'm not gonna fly all the way to Mexico if I have this delicious food right here. And this nice lady comes out every morning and puts this brand new, like feeding station out, I'm just gonna hang out here, just hope for the best. So that's what they actually tend, tend to do. That's your second one. Interesting question, yeah. So question was, for those um, tuning in virtually, uh, there was a question about the presence of vultures in the area and why would they be gravitating towards a certain area for a couple months or weeks in the spring? Uh, this is a recent phenomenon here. Why are they doing this? So they're turkey vultures, and um, there are many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of turkey vultures all across Central and North America. And in the springtime, they're migrating from uh, mostly Mexico up into all parts of the Western part of our continent, even parts of Canada. And what they're doing is they're following these corridors, like I mentioned, these important highways. The Colorado River, starts in the southern or the northern end of the Sea of Cortez, the Gulf of California, Mexico, and runs basically all the way up to Hoover Dam in a north-south trajectory. So they're following the Colorado River and they get to Lake Mead and they're like, well, now what? I want to cross this water. Do I go left into Las Vegas or do I go right towards the Colorado Plateau? And for those that go maybe right and around the lake and end up here, they're looking for prominent places to roost. So you're probably seeing these birds coming in the afternoon and the morning. They, they tend to have this, um, this pattern where they are so social communally in the evening that they'll roost together. And so they are coming in and seeing their buddies like going to a certain tree. And maybe some of those birds were there like two days before and still hanging out. So the new ones come in and join those. And then maybe some of the ones that have been around a couple of days, they leave, but the newcomers come in and stay until the next ones can come up, right? Because it's happening over the course of a few weeks. So they're seeing where the ones that had been there already a couple of days before are hanging out and they go there. It's really interesting, but they're communal roosters. So that means that they're hanging out with other birds of the same species because they know it's safe for whatever reason. There's safety in numbers and there's safety in other birds that didn't that's a spot. Now, there might be, in, in like Overton, for example, there's one cottonwood tree that has no leaf cover that the vultures are gravitating towards. But if you lose that tree, if it's cut down, well, they have to find another ideal cottonwood. So it could be that one of their favorite roosts year after year has been cut down somewhere in the region and your, your spot was the next one up. Ooh, this is a great question about a great bird. Do roadrunners migrate? If so, how far? They don't migrate. Um, they will move up and down in elevation, kind of like I mentioned, birds will kind of go down in the wintertime and maybe they'll head back up in the spring. Our populations of roadrunners are actually, they, they're dynamic in that they ebb and flow big time. They're kind of like snowshoe hares up in Alaska. They go through these boom and bust cycles. Roadrunners feed on reptiles, small birds, insects, arachnids, scorpions, spiders, they'll even eat snakes. Lizards go after rattlesnakes. In the wintertime, they're not finding their rattlesnakes, they're not finding their lizards, they're not really finding a lot of their insects. So their populations actually kind of crash in the wintertime. So you'll probably notice a little less in February than you would say in uh, the end of summer because they've crashed. A couple of, especially the young ones, die throughout the wintertime. It's tough being a wild animal. And so then they'll they'll bump back up in the spring. So especially if you have a good monsoonal year. We had all these pennant winged grasshoppers this year. They're everywhere. I'm sure you had them here. Um, it's a good year for roadrunners. So they're going to recover, but throughout the wintertime, they're going to find less insects and their population is going to crash. But then they'll come back up in the spring and summer. Yeah, so there's a question of pinion jay 
uh, and loggerhead shrike numbers have declined uh, quite drastically? And the answer is yes. Uh, pinion jay numbers have dropped about 80% in the last 50 years. And so that's a big time decline. We can't say for sure exactly why. The idea is probably that the pinion cones are not being produced by the pinion pines. And that probably is associated with drought. And a lot of that drought, not all of it, because droughts are, are normal occurrences in nature. Uh, probably some of it has to do with, uh, with climate change. So um, that's why Great Basin Bird Observatory and Red Rock Island is big on monitoring the pinion jay populations. The loggerhead shrike is also declining big time. We don't have a lot of agriculture in Nevada. Uh, throughout a lot of the range, their, their populations are declining because of the uses of pesticides and insecticides in agricultural areas. So loggerhead shrikes feed on grasshoppers, bugs, mice, and <laughs> those mice, those grasshoppers, they've eaten a lot of insecticides or pesticides, and that gets passed along to the shrike and the shrike uh, and other birds like American kestrels, their populations are declining in these areas, but there's a lot of agriculture. So a lot of, a lot of the Midwest, parts of California have that. They are declining here in, um, in the Mojave Desert too. A lot of birds are declining in the Mojave Desert. You could kind of pick any species other than the, the common raven and it's declining. The reason the common raven is increasing is because they're insanely smart and we've created highways, and railroads and rest stops and they can nest in, um, in like telephone poles and uh, transmission poles, uh, cell phone towers, and then go eat roadkill in the morning and make a pretty good living. Most other birds are not doing so well here in the Mojave Desert. I think we've lost about 50% of our biomass of birds in the last 70 years, according to studies. It's a lot of birds lost. Question is, uh, is climate change changing how birds migrate or when they're migrating. I grew up in South Florida. Uh, I will answer the question by giving some background on this. I grew up in South Florida at the very tip of a peninsula that is close to the West Indies. And we have a lot of science going on in South Florida and Everglades National Park, Florida Keys, Dratchatugas National Park, Biscay National Park, um, and a lot of bird watchers that have been monitoring bird populations throughout the year in the southern part of this peninsula. And in the West Indies and the Yucatan of Mexico, we have lots of neotropical bird species that uh, will winter down there and not come back up until, uh, until spring or summer. So we're not seeing these birds typically for December, January, and February, but some of these birds are starting to stay in the winter time in parts of Florida when ordinarily they should be gone by the end of fall, not to return until the spring again. Some of them are staying there because we're getting warmer, milder winters in Florida. And this is happening all across the board. Uh, we're seeing that here in Clark County where um, things like yellow warblers and other species that are insectivores are staying later and later and later. So with citizen science programs, we have lots of people who are monitoring bird species um, day after day. They're able to keep track of this type of thing. The data is saying that these birds are staying later in the fall. They're arriving earlier in the spring. We've had a very windy year. How do these birds survive these gusts? I'll, let, I'll go back to my Florida days where we have hurricanes. And I, I wondered about this when I was a little kid, uh, watching birds and, and sitting in my house while uh, tropical storms and hurricanes passed by the house and put tree limbs through our roof and I'd wake up in the morning and see some of these little tiny songbirds uh, flying around the next day eating as if nothing had happened. They have, uh, they can sense barometric pressure uh, pretty well so they can, they can get ready for a storm coming through and they can sense a, a weather system that's going to come rock their world for a little bit. Some of them will try to outfly it. If they can't do that, then they will uh, actually hang tight. They have really strong grip strength, actually, birds. So they can hold on to something and just hold on for dear life for hours or a day or two. Um, sometimes they'll get low where the wind's not so strong. And uh, if you can do this next time it's a windy day, figure out where the wind is coming from and go to the leeward side of a structure and see what's going on there. 
So go to the side of the structure where there's not a lot of wind going on. You will find the birds there. They're not going to be on that windward side. They're going to be where the wind is not impacting them as much. With fires over the last few years, are birds losing uh, habitat? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say exactly what's attributing to what because we just don't have a lot of information on enough individual species and their movements to say yet. Uh, it's, it's hard to keep track of individual birds, where they've come from, where they're born, and all the areas along the way that they've migrated. There's some towers called modus towers that are uh, actually cell phone towers that can uh, ping birds that have transmission packs on their, their backs, these tiny little backpacks that send signals to cell phone towers that are coming out. That's going to revolutionize the way that we understand bird movements. That's, we're on the cusp of that. We're going to get a couple all around Southern Nevada, all across North America and Mexico. And that's going to give us a lot of insight. For now, uh, we can only look at data like Christmas bird count data and our uh, birdathon data, citizen science data, and then you know the occasional U.S. Fish and Wildlife data that comes in. But it's still very light compared to how many bird species are around and how many habitats are coming from. But it it appears that um, what what we do know, like in places like the Yosemite Ranger, or like Sierra Nevada. Uh, parts of Oregon, parts of Washington, Colorado that have experienced really big fires recently. We know that in those places, birds are not breeding for a couple of years until some of the vegetation can come back. So you have these different stages of what's called plant secession. And when you have mature forests that's burned off, well, a lot of those birds that breed in those mature forests, uh, they don't breed for a couple of years or they go somewhere else. Um, They'll try to go someplace that's not overcrowded with other species. Sometimes because of territory, they can't find a place to breed and they gotta get pushed out and they don't get to breed and then they die without passing along the genes. That's not good for the population overall. Um, but then you might have plant secession, sort of like that emergent primary secession uh, might come in into a burnt area and then you might get birds that really um, do well in the primary secession plant communities that come up and they might have some banner years for a couple of years. Um, for example, uh, there are birds that do well around burnt areas like the black-backed woodpecker, the three-toed woodpecker, western woodpecker, and all cider flycatcher are four species that breed from the Rockies all the way up into Alaska and the Sierra Nevada that do well in burnt forests. They'll do well in those burnt forests. Uh, the birds that don't do well in burnt forests, well, they're not going to do well, but that's, that's nature. It's always ebbing and flowing. Are there any uh, impacts due to solar farms? What brought me out to Las Vegas uh, in 2015 was working as a biologist at the Ivanpah Solar Generating Facility over near Prim, Nevada. It's actually in California. It's one of just a few of its kind. It's one of those facilities that have large towers where mirrors are bouncing solar radiation onto the towers. And some of those towers can get about 500 degrees Fahrenheit on a hot day. And they actually look like lakes from the distance. So birds migrating through the desert, they're like, oh boy, three lakes out in the middle of the desert. I'm so lucky. And they get there and it's actually just a fatal attraction. Um, those places do lose birds. We did see and estimate that a, a couple thousand birds there every every year at those sites. Um, drops in the bucket and in, uh, in, in the greater scheme of things, but still quite a bit. Um, so green energy is not as green as we'd like it to be. Those are that type of facility. Photovoltaic, your very common sort of regular solar panels that you can put on roofs, way less problematic in terms of killing birds uh, if they collide with them or run into them or get attracted to them. What they do do is they change that landscape forever. Plants don't really grow around them all that well. There's nothing to really feed the birds once they're there, um, but they don't do nearly the harm that, uh, that like wind turbines do or some of those concentrated solar facilities like the one in Tonopah and the one near Prim, Nevada. So the question was, um, how can non-scientists get involved with citizen science projects? Fortunately, citizen science projects are everywhere. There's an app for everything and they try to make them as user-friendly as possible. Basically, 
universities and uh, state and federal agencies understand that they cannot collect enough information quickly enough within their own devices. So they have reached out to the, the citizens and communities to ask them to participate in them. One of my jobs with Red Rock Audubon is to uh, train people how to use things like eBird, participate in our Great Basin uh, uh, Bird Observatory projects like with the Pinion Jay, uh, participate in Christmas bird counts. All those things are great things to do because it takes people power. It takes people power to do these things and of course, identifying birds is difficult. You can spend your entire life trying to figure out what the heck you're looking at, right? It's not easy, uh, but some of them are pretty user-friendly and sometimes we actually uh, make it really easy by creating programs where the birds are easy to identify. Like we have some that are aimed at the mountain bluebird or the Western bluebird. It's usually pretty easy to identify one of just five species of bluebirds that you can get. And so you can participate in Audubon's Climate Watch by going out to areas and looking for mountain bluebirds and reporting whether or not you have mountain bluebirds or not. Um, so those types of things can happen. Yeah, uh, eBird is another great program. eBird is, you know, you just create a username. You can start tomorrow in your backyard and just kind of see what happens. It's eBird.org. It's run by the Cornell School of Bird. Oh, uh, so there is Merlin, which is through Cornell, uh, that can help you identify birds. eBird is, is for keeping data and, and doing surveys. And to, but to answer your question, uh, what's the best way to do it? Stay in touch with me and I'll help you get set up. Yeah, but, but there, I, I, there's no like central place to do all these different things, which it, there really should be, but Great Basin Bird Observatory is doing stuff. Smithsonian's doing stuff. Cornell is doing stuff. iNaturalist is its own thing. Um, you, there are all these different places to go, but they're not really centralized. Yeah, so stay in touch with me and I'll figure out what's best for you. There's a question over there. And, uh, yeah, the, the question was, uh, what's the lifespan for a lot of these smaller birds? You're talking about like a sparrow and mockingbird, like what's your lifespan? If you were to have a bird in captivity, like anything else, you would see how old that bird could get when it has food every day guaranteed and no predation, like no threat of being eaten by something, you'd see that these birds can live a remarkably long time, 12 or 13 years. But with the wear and tear uh, and the uncertainties of, of finding food or cover or water, you tend to get like some birds mostly around the three to four years of age before they, they die. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not a long time. So that's why when you have these big events, these big catastrophic events, and bird population uh, declines, that if you don't have birds breeding for like two years in a row, you'll see big declines because there aren't a lot of adults that can have young that can replace the ones that had been lost in the few years prior. Uh, some of your hawks and your eagles though, they, uh, how's the condor reintroduction program going? Really well, really well. This is one of those things where like, I could tell you a bunch of bad news, uh, I can also tell you some of the times that there's good news. And uh, it's, it's important that we look towards those examples as conservationists. I assume most of you are interested in that, the well-being and flourishment of wildlife, right? Um, to look at these examples, and so the peregrine falcon, the bald eagle, uh, the, the wading birds, and the California condor are all great examples of good management programs being successful. California condor was down to no wild birds anymore, and a lot of them were captured and put into uh, captivity and into breeding programs. And now uh, Vermilion Cliffs, um, Zion, and a lot of California, even Northern Baja, all have California condors flying free again. Uh, many of them still have the tags, so there aren't really any birds around yet that weren't tagged. So we're not at a point where there, there are birds out there that aren't being monitored, but this is a, a success story. A lot of it has to do with uh, lead and ammunition. So these birds uh, are eating carrion, they're eating deer, they're eating big horn sheep, they're eating cows sometimes. And if, a, if an animal is shot and uh, with a lead bullet and that lead gets into the bloodstream, any trace amount of it that is eaten by a California condor can kill it. So it doesn't take a lot of lead to kill a California condor. So that is why uh, a lot of these programs in some of these states where they're incentivizing hunters to use less lead bullets, uh, you're seeing uh, California condors kind of bump up in populations. All right.
Well, thank you, everybody. I'll be here. Uh, a little bit later.